You either retire a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become Ric Flair. It's time for a face lock feature. Hello, I'm Marvin, and I'm the Movie Monster. We're trying something a little new here on Toonytown Wrestling today. In addition to the song parodies and headlock headlines, I do like to run these feature segments weekly. They're in-depth looks at featured topic, and it's going to be a little different from everything else we've done up to now. But I figured let's try it out and see how you guys like it. In the world of wrestling, the immortal words of Dream Babe Ruth in the Sandlot ring true. In this world, there are heroes and legends. Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Now, the word legend is thrown around loosely in the WWE. Very loosely. But what truly immortalizes a wrestling legend is the legacy they leave behind. Unfortunately, some legends don't know when enough is enough, and they stick around long after their expiration date has come and gone. Oh, we'll get to you another day. Through their actions later in life, the amazing things they've accomplished throughout their legendary careers are tarnished, and our memories of them become muddled. But at the same time, there are wrestlers who have had a rough go of it for a while, whether from personal demons, bad politics, or poor decisions, and in later years, they managed to turn it all around. So, this week for our Face Lock feature, we're taking a look at five wrestlers who destroyed their legacies, and five who saved them. Uh, for this list, I'm keeping it on wrestling personalities that are no longer active. So, you won't see Chris Jericho on this particular list for example, but he is actively putting his legacy through a wood chipper. We're going to go back and forth from bad to good, and these are presented in no particular order. Let's start with our first wrestler who completely demolished his legendary legacy. Number one, Ric Flair. This is one of the entries on our bad list that breaks my heart to pieces. And before I get into this, I feel the need to say something that I believe with all my heart. Ric Flair is the greatest professional wrestler of all time time. He was the standard bearer, the measuring stick. He was everything it meant to be a professional wrestler. The styling, the profiling, the promos, the persona, it was all spot on. And when it came time for the bell to ring, there was no one better to get it done than the Nature Boy. Flair carried the NWA and eventually WCW on his back. Even in the days when short-sighted executives tried to move away from Slick Rick, eventually they all came crawling back. And Flair was just as good of a babyface as he was a heel. There was nothing he couldn't do. No opponent he couldn't make look like a legitimate star. He was the 16-time World Heavyweight Champion, and no one could ever deny his greatness. Flair's twilight run in the WWE only solidified this. At a time when Rick himself was experiencing a crisis, crisis of confidence, his run with Evolution, and epic matches against The Undertaker, Randy Orton, Triple H, and even <laughs> were unbelievable masterpieces. Jim Ross called him the Rembrandt of the wrestling canvas, and Rick proved him right time and time again. And when it was time to ride off in the sunset, Flair did so in the most satisfying way possible. He walked the aisle one last time at WrestleMania in Orlando, Florida, where he faced off against the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels in a show-stealing career highlight performance. The next night on Raw, the show was dedicated to Flair, with the entire roster coming out to show their thanks and acknowledge the greatest professional wrestler who ever lived. Ric Flair's tears that night were genuine and earned. It wasn't some weeping vagina crying at a press conference. It was an outpouring of love from a man who gave everything he had to the sport he loved, taking one final bow before riding off into the sunset forever. And that should have been it. But it wasn't. Soon after Flair's epic retirement, he sold his soul to the Hulkster, embarking on a tour with Hogan where he would face off against his old nemesis in the ring once more. A lot of people rolled their eyes at this, but the matches were never televised to my knowledge, and they were easy to ignore. Then along came Dixie. <sighs> When Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff went to TNA, Flair came along with them. He started out working with talent like AJ Styles in a non-wrestling capacity. The Nature Boy persona never truly fit Styles, but getting the rub from Flair didn't hide him. And then we got, in my opinion, the most classic post-retirement Flair moment ever in his famous woo-off promo with Jay Lethal. But after that, things started to go off the rails. It wasn't long before Flair was back in the ring. His match with Lethal is personally one of my favorites, but mostly because I really like Jay Lethal as an old-school ROH fan, and I was so happy for him getting to work with an H. But then he went on to have matches with Hogan and Sting, where he just looked like a sad old bleeding man trying to recapture his glory days. Following the tragic death of Flair's son, Reed, Rick sunk into a deep, alcohol-soaked depression, and we started to see him over the years lash out at people like Becky Lynch. 
Then, an episode of Doc's Side of the Ring about the infamous plane ride from hell ad, in which it's alleged that Flair cornered a flight attendant and started flashing his little nature around. And no, I'm not talking about Charles Robinson. From there, we went into the abomination that was Ric Flair's last match, the brainchild of Ric's son-in-law, Conrad Thompson, a man who buys his father-in-law's worn clothing items with the voracious appetite of a man with 97 OnlyFans subscriptions. Flair teamed with his other son-in-law, Andrade, to take on the team of Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal while wearing a ridiculous purple bodysuit, bleeding all over the place, and embarrassing himself completely. Even Jarrett and Lethal couldn't salvage this one, and our final memory of Rick in the ring went from this to this. Now he's wooing his way around AEW dressed like a rapper and hawking fake money and toxic jet fuel in a can disguised as an energy drink. In his WWE-produced documentary, he even noted that his alcohol issues are still wildly out of control with no end in sight. He's publicly complained about his AEW booking and has said that while he doesn't think Tony Khan will let him, he wants to get into the ring. He even once said he wanted to die in the ring wrestling Sammy Guevara. And given Sammy's track record with both hottie boys, Rick just might get his wish if Tony ever gives him the nod. All right, that was a long one. They're not all going to be that long, and that's why I started here. So let's move on to someone who salvaged their legacy and created a lot of goodwill with the fans and wrestlers alike. Number one, Shawn Michaels. For the front half of his career, Shawn Michaels was hailed as one of the greatest performers of all time. He was also known as one of the biggest backstage assholes one could encounter. Sean's inflated view of himself, coupled with a childish attitude and a pretty serious drug problem, rubbed everyone from The Undertaker to Jim Cornette the wrong way. The locker room was basically united against HBK throughout the mid to late 90s, with Bret Hart chief among his detractors. After the Montreal incident at Survivor Series 97, Sean's heat in the back was reaching nuclear levels. Though he denied involvement in the infamous screw job at first, everyone knew the truth. Then, a backdrop onto a casket in January of 1998 caused a career-ending back injury. Sean was able to make it through another two months before dropping the WWF title to Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 14 to officially kick off what we now know as the Attitude Era. After that, Sean would pop up periodically as the new WWF commissioner, but his issues weren't getting any better. After showing up the TV blitzed out of his mind, Sean's longtime best friend Triple H told management that for his own good, Sean needed to be sent home. That left Sean a broken legend with a poor reputation and a lazy eye. But during that time, Sean found religion and managed to find the strength to kick his addictions once and for all. What's more, the pain in his back was going away. Now, in his autobiography, Sean attributes this to his prayers being answered, and whether you believe that or not, this event led to the ultimate redemption. Sean returned at SummerSlam 2002, facing off against Triple H in an instant classic. Sean was back, and Triple H was at his very best that night, working the back in a way that made the audience cringe with every bump. After that, Sean captured the World Heavyweight Championship in the first ever Elimination Chamber match. While his outings in these early shows was spotty, Sean recaptured the magic at WrestleMania 19, stealing the show with Chris Jericho in a career-defining outing for both men. After that, Sean went on to work another seven years, main eventing WrestleMania three times, and even having what many call the greatest match in WrestleMania history with The Undertaker at WrestleMania 25 before retiring at WrestleMania 26. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention his memorable feud with Hulk Hogan. <laughs> But in the back, Sean was a changed man. He was a locker room leader and a positive force for change. After his retirement, Sean continued to work with the company and hardly anyone, save for bald FTR, and really who gives a damn what that idiot has to say, spoke a bad word about him. Now, Sean runs NXT, preparing the next generation of WWE superstars. He went from backstage menace and pillhead to one of the most beloved and respected legends in the history of pro wrestling. All right, hope you're all feeling good, because now it's back to the bad. Let's move on to our next legacy destroyer. Number two, the fabulous Moolah. If you were talking about women's wrestling any time before the late 90s, there's a good chance you were talking about the fabulous Moolah. She was the WWF Women's Champion for over 20 years, and she essentially ran women's wrestling in the United States. She trained and handled the bookings for all the female grapplers, and no one ever thought twice about it. Later in life, she'd appear beside Mae Young on WWE TV, inspiring some of the very best Jerry Lawler quotes of all time. It wasn't until after Moolah's death that a lot of dark information started to leak out. When WWE tried to name the WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal the Fabulous Moolah Memorial Battle Royal, people started to speak up. Moolah was accused of exploiting her trainees, ensuring they went into debt to her by forcing them to pay for training and room and board on her property. 
She would take a minimum of 25% of their pay, and some women booked through Mula never saw a dime for years. Others stated that she essentially kept them prisoner on her property, not allowing them to leave unless they were accompanied by someone Mula trusted. And most damning of all were the allegations that Mula was trafficking these women, pimping them out as sex objects to any promoter who would pay. While some have spoken in Mula's defense over the years, none have turned public opinion. The legacy of the fabulous Moolah is that of an exploitative sex trafficker and not a pioneer in women's wrestling. Wow, that was a dark one. Let's move on to a feel-good story. Number two, Dusty Rhodes. Dusty was a force to be reckoned with and is one of the greatest professional wrestling personalities of all time. He was also a creative force behind the scenes serving as booker for Jim Crockett Promotions and then later WCW. But after the fall of WCW, Big Dust was left out in the cold, so to speak. His son, Cody Rhodes, has spoken at length about the hard times, if you will, that befell the Rhodes family. Dusty had to sell off his Rolex, do local car commercials, and work matches for ECW to keep his family above water. Perhaps it was some lingering bad blood between him and the WWE, but it took a while for Dusty to get the treatment a legend of his caliber deserved. And back then, to my great annoyance, a lot of people talked about the dream in a negative light. He was mocked and degraded through characters like Virgil and Goldust for years. But once Dusty returned to the WWE... Everything was different. He became a guiding force in the developmental system, guiding an entire generation of stars. People like Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, Charlotte, Becky Lynch, and just about anyone who's anyone in the WWE main event scene right now matured under the learning tree of the American dream. They were even called Dusty's Kids, much to the annoyance of Dusty's actual kids. Dusty's Hall of Fame induction was a major highlight. He was inducted by his sons, Dustin and Cody, in a moment that is impossible to not smile through. Now, Dusty is remembered as the legend he always was. His name lives on forever, and his legacy is proudly picked up by his two sons, who continue to do their big daddy proud by being consummate professionals and quality athletes. (sighs) All right, before I start crying like MJF with a paper cut, let's move on to someone who screwed themselves over. Number three, Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan is synonymous with pro wrestling, or at least with the WWE or WWF. He became a household name through the 80s and 90s. Hulkamania ran wild all over the world. He was then able to do something few were capable of in later years, completely reinvent himself, turning heel in WCW as part of the New World Order. When Hogan returned to the WWF, I was always confused as to why they thought he was going to be a heel. He came in with the NWO and faced off with The Rock at WrestleMania 18 in what is, in my opinion, one of the greatest spectacles of all time. The love that the fans showed the resurgent Hogan was incredible, and it wasn't long before he was once again the WWE Undisputed Champion. He had memorable matches during this run with Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, and less memorable outings with Triple H and The Undertaker. The highlight of this was WrestleMania 19, when he wrestled... God damn it, Trip! stop doing that. (laughs) Anyway, it was a match that was far better than it had any business being. But then something unfortunate happened. He started talking more. Every time Hogan opened his mouth, some new outrageous lie came through his lips. Whether it was something like conveniently making amends with the Macho Man and the Ultimate Warrior before their deaths, or something more insane like that he was there when Bruiser Brody died, or that he was asked to be the bass player of a Metallica, Hogan became a joke. Every time he talked about WrestleMania 3, the crowd got bigger and Andre got heavier. Hulkamania died officially in 2015 when Hogan got caught on tape using racial slurs while being secretly filmed having relations with his then-best friend's wife. Don't worry, though. His then-best friend knew and was the one secretly filming him. Now we see Hogan getting booed regularly, most notably while dressed as a pirate at WrestleMania. A recent appearance at the Hall of Fame was notable when the New Day refused to applaud him. The world's wrestling superhero has become a hated punchline. Tony Khan even went so far as to ban him and his ex-wife Linda from all AEW shows until he inevitably decides he wants to go to AEW and then suddenly he'll be a hero again to the internet fans. All right, back to the good. Let's focus on someone who has turned public perception around. Number three, Eric Bischoff. For years, Eric Bischoff was the ultimate wrestling villain, the perfect scapegoat to pin atrocities on both in and out of the ring. 
The man who defeated Vince McMahon for 83 consecutive weeks was infamous for actions like firing Stone Cold Steve Austin over the phone, supposedly throwing coffee on Eddie Guerrero, trying to financially destroy Ric Flair, giving away WWE results live on Nitro, and letting Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash use creative control to drive WCW into the ground. When he went to WWE as an on-air talent, things were rocky at first. He was attacked by Ric Flair in the locker room, and there was a lot of bad blood floating around. But over time, people who once cursed his name, like Chris Jericho and Steve Austin, were actually starting to say what a cool, down-to-earth guy Eric really was. Now, say what you will about his time in TNA, and believe me, we'll get to that at some point, Eric was a different person after the demise of WCW. Now older and wiser, Eric hosts his own podcast, 83 Weeks, where he gives thoughtful commentary on modern wrestling. Eric acknowledges the mistakes of his past, owns his history of arrogance and shady actions, and has come out on the other side clean for it. It seems like the only people that still hate Eric Bischoff a Tony Khan and the AEW fans. <sighs> this next one is really going to break my heart, guys. But it has to be done. <sighs> Let's move on to our next Tarnished Legacy. Number four, Sting. <sighs> I didn't want to do it. I really didn't. <sighs> but it has to be done. When I was a little monster, I had a hero. A dark figure with a voice of silence who battled the evil collective trying to overrun pro wrestling. A man who single-handedly would... Flair always said that if the WWF had gotten their hands on Sting, there never would have been a Hulk Hogan. I agree with this. Sting was a comic book character in real life, back when that still meant something. He went from colorful outfits and face paint to black and white while stalking from the shadows. It was an incredible transformation, a total reinvention. It was like going from Superman to Batman. And as a guy who was never really a strong promo, him shutting the hell up for a year and a half did a lot of good. He was so bulletproof, so over, so incredible that he survived the Hogan fast count sabotage at Starcade 97 and a ridiculous and unnecessary heel turn in the later days of WCW. Sting to TNA instead of crossing into the WWE. Sting gave the upstart promotion legitimacy and we got to see exactly what he could still do. Honestly, as much as I love Crow Sting versus the NWO, I gotta admit, his TNA run is probably the best of his career bar none. Even during the Hogan era, when Sting once again weirdly turned heel and did this cringy Joker gimmick, he was still a legend, an icon. Then he went to WWE. You know, I get some crap from time to time from people who say I never criticize WWE. Well, buckle the hell up. To say WWE mismanaged Sting would be the understatement of the millennium. And I'm going to suspend the running censorship gag that we've had going on for this segment because it has to be called out. Vince McMahon had no idea what to do with this man, this legend that he had no hand in creating. Sting's arrival was fantastic, and he was treated with the reverence and respect that he deserved. But after all that, it was all downhill. Once Sting's WrestleMania match with Triple H was billed as WWE vs. WCW a full 14 years after WCW went out of business, I knew exactly where this was going. Kick, wham, pedigree, one, two, three. Vince used Sting as a means of getting one last screw you in on Ted Turner, long after Turner gave the slightest damn about this feud. Not only that, but after DX ran in, Sting was backed up by the NWO? That made no sense. If anyone was going to run in for him, it should have been the Horseman. It felt like an excuse to get Hall and Nash out there so Tripp could have a moment in the ring with all his buddies. After that, Sting wrestled Seth Rollins for the WWE Championship and was not only defeated, he suffered a career-ending injury. Sting's disastrous, mismanaged WWE run ended with an 0-2 record and a note from a doctor saying he'd never wrestle again. But he got his Hall of Fame induction, and I think most of us believe that he was still retiring with his legacy intact. Then along came Tony Khan. Tony brought Sting into AEW, and of course, he called in his own doctor who gave Sting a clean bill of health and cleared him for competition. I think we have some footage of that doctor arriving to the building. Hi, everybody! Hi, Hi Dr. Dr. Nick! After that, Sting looked like a sad old man wrestling tag matches with this skater douche, who they paired with him solely because he wears face paint. He competed in a long sleeve t-shirt, which looked ridiculous. How bad could his arms and shoulders actually look? The guy used to wear a bodysuit and it looked fine. Where did this ridiculous getup come from? On top of that, instead of Sting raising everyone up around him, the AEW roster did what it does best. It pulled him down to their level. 
Now he was seeing the former kid from Venice Beach, California, trading wimpy kicks with orange freaking Cassidy. I wanted to puke. Sting was also very limited in what he could do, probably because of the whole career-ending injury that didn't go away. More often than not, he was no-selling for young guys, which does nothing for anyone. And when he wasn't doing that, he was diving off balconies like he's New Jack, there's a comparison I never thought I'd make, and bouncing his head off the concrete. Watching my childhood hero debase himself week in and week out while this ridiculous man-child spouted off that he was having the best run of his career was insanely frustrating. I hate that this is how it ended for an absolute legend. If Tony had used Sting to create new stars and get the next generation over on the way out, then I might look a bit more positively on this run. But Sting retired from AEW completely undefeated. This wasn't an investment in wrestling's future. It was a billionaire man-child smashing his action figures together with not a single thought given to what comes next. The final insult came when Sting's final match was against these whiteheads on the forehead of the world, the Young Bucks. Now, Sting's last match was decent, I'll admit. It involved his sons dressed as their father from various points in his careers and absolutely dwarfing the AEW roster with their size. It even featured the man called Sting getting his hand raised at the end, which I know I just complained about him retiring undefeated, but I'd rather see that than see him lose to the Young Bucks. All right, moving on to a perceived triumph that I think is going to ruffle some feathers. Number four, the ultimate warrior. Don't click away! yet hear me out on this one look i'm not saying the warrior was a good person he was objectively not by all accounts but wwe marketing and some very unfortunate events worked hand in hand to pick his legacy up out of the mud and shine a positive light on a person that not many people have anything positive to say about the Warrior has a very checkered past in wrestling, from holding Vince McMahon up for money at SummerSlam 91 to failing to protect his opponents in the ring. The Warrior was a guy that no one liked. He was so that crap crazy that he actually changed his name to Warrior legally and believed fully in the concept of distrocity. I'd explain to you what that is, but honestly, I have no idea. WWE released one of the most honest documentaries of all time when they put out the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior DVD, with everyone from Triple H to Bobby Heenan and Hulk Hogan ripping the Warrior to absolute shreds. Then, years later, Warrior and the WWE seemed to patch things up, and he headlined that year's Hall of Fame class. Suddenly, the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior documentary was a thing that the company wanted you to forget. The WWE PR team did an insanely good job in repairing the image that they themselves worked to destroy years before. Warrior had a hero's welcome into the Hall of Fame. He then appeared on Raw the next night and cut the first coherent promo of his life to a huge ovation. The people's belief in the Ultimate Warrior and his renewed legacy had never been at a higher point since WrestleMania 6. And then he died the next day. Now, it's possible the Warrior was a changed man and had matured in his twilight years. Had he lived on, it was possible he would have continued to redeem himself in the eyes of the fans to this day. It's also possible that history would have repeated itself. He might have done or said something to put him finally back on the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior path. But we'll never know. The fans' final memory of the Warrior is a Friday to Monday stretch of pure positivity, and that will forever be how he's remembered for better or worse. WWE soon released an updated Ultimate Warrior documentary that was extremely flattering. Triple H went from calling him the most unprofessional guy he'd ever stepped in the ring with to crying for the man. Warrior's wife, Dana Warrior, continues to work with the WWE and has presented the Warrior Award at the Hall of Fame several times since the death of her husband. All right, let's move on to our last Tarnish story. This one has a literal body count. Number five, Sonny. Oh, Tammy. Yours is a tragic tale, not just for you, but for those unfortunate enough to cross your path. Tammy Lynn Sitch, known to WWE fans as Sunny, was the original diva. She was the first woman the company presented as pure eye candy, serving as an on-air personality and manager. After a successful stint in Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Tammy arrived in the WWE with her real-life boyfriend Chris Candido as part of the Body Donnas. She was renamed Sunny and was an overnight sensation. She was kind of an Attitude Era precursor, adding sensuality to the show in a way that wrestling hadn't seen much up to that point. It was the early days of America Online when people all over the world were first discovering that they could download pictures of beautiful women on the internet. And it wasn't long before Sunny was the most downloaded woman in the world. Of course, all that fame went to Tammy's head, and after a while, she started to gather nuclear levels of heat in the locker room. There's one story about the night the Godwins poured the slot bucket on her. 
Apparently there was DNA from about 30 different people mixed in there. That was when Tammy started doing drugs and living that party life. While most wrestlers of the day started taking somas to cope with the pain they were in, Tammy was using them recreationally. She was also seeing Shawn Michaels at the time, and as we pointed out in our earlier entry, at that time Shawn wasn't the most popular guy in the WWF family. When Sable showed up, Sonny had seemingly been replaced, which I never understood. In my personal opinion, Sable never held a candle to Sonny, but Tammy's attitude and personal demons might have played a role in this. She ended up leaving the WWF for Paul Heyman's ECW promotion, reuniting with Candido, who had also developed a really bad drug problem at the time. In 2005, after Candido tragically passed away from a blood clot and pneumonia, things seemed to get worse for Tammy, but eventually it seemed as though she got her act together and was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. But of course these things don't last, and it wasn't long before Tammy was doing creepy photo ops with fans where they could actually lay in a bed with her. After that, she started selling nude photos and doing porn. On. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with that kind of work, it was a little sad to see someone who was once at the top of the wrestling world hawking pictures of a hoo-ha on the internet. During this time, Tammy racked up more than seven DUIs. She also kept getting caught driving on a suspended license, and everyone knew that if she didn't clean up her act, eventually something tragic was going to happen. Well, that ended up coming to fruition just a few years ago, while Tammy, under the influence and with no license, got in a car accident that took the life of a 75-year-old man. She was arrested and charged with DUI manslaughter. She's currently serving 17 years of a prison sentence with 8 years of probation. She'll be in her late 60s by the time she gets out and well into her 70s by the time the probation ends. It was a truly sad end to a sad story for the original WWE diva. Alright, let's close on a good note. Someone who came back from the brink to reclaim their life. Number 5. Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake the Snake Roberts is one of the greatest in-ring performers of all time. He's also one of the greatest talkers of all time. The Snake had a handle on ring psychology and storytelling like no one else. During an era where everyone screamed their promos at the camera, this man defied the norm with a calm, calculated, cold, and removed tone that gave only a hint of the sinister mind that shined behind hauntingly disturbing eyes that bore through you. But behind the scenes, Jake Roberts had a lot of personal demons. As the years went on, Jake suffered relapse after relapse, returning to booze and crack time and time again. After a while, he stopped being synonymous with his fascinating wake on the mic and in the ring, and became something of a poster child for the darker side of wrestling, the toll that this kind of career could take on you. Movies like Behind the Mat and WWE's Jake the Snake documentary shone a bright light on these issues. And while so many wrestlers succumbed to the demons, dying prematurely, Jake Roberts continued on. This was something Jake himself reflected on time and time again. It seemed as though fate or destiny or God or the universe wasn't done with Jake Roberts yet. Then along came a hero. And I mean that, folks. A hero. Diamond Dallas Page, a legendary wrestler in his own right turned personal fitness and accountability guru, stepped in to help his one-time mentor. DDP's efforts to revitalize Jake and help him reclaim the life he had thrown away is captured better than I could ever relay in the documentary film The Resurrection of Jake the Snake Roberts. The film and this story culminated in Jake's WWE Hall of Fame induction, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. These were once more Ein tears, not MJF weeping vagina tears. Now Jake appears periodically on AEW TV, and unlike a lot of his compatriots who crossed into Tony Land, Jake has done nothing to embarrass himself. Jake's promos have been great, and when he appears in a manager role, he's one of the highlights of the show. Jake Roberts rose from insurmountable odds to reclaim his legacy in an industry that both gave and took everything from him at one time. There's a more triumphant legacy resurrection in wrestling, I have yet to see it. Alright, maybe Eddie Guerrero, but that deserves its own video on another day. And there you have it! Originally, this list was supposed to be 20 wrestlers, 10 on each side, but the script was getting really long. Uh, there will be a part two in the future, and if you guys like this, we'll cover more triumphs like Michael Cole and Scott Hall, along with tragedies like Vince McMahon and Chris Benoit. Thanks for watching. Please let me know what you think about future Face Lock feature segments like this, and stay tuned for more comedy videos like song parodies and the headlock headlines. Like, share, and subscribe. Click the bell icon at the top of the page to get notified of new videos as they drop. And a huge thanks to our patrons over at patreon.com slash Wrestling. If you want to support the show and have access to exclusive TTW content, then head over there and join the party. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'm Marvin the Movie Monster. Let's get out of here!